About a month ago, we did a video covering The Future is Wild, a docu-series from the early 2000s on the topic of speculative evolution. It was really fun to make, and I'm very happy with how the final product came out. I would have never guessed that after I published that video, the creator of The Future is Wild herself would reach out to me to talk ideas about creating more content together. Before I knew it, Joanna Adams and John Kapener sat down on a Zoom call with me to express their appreciation for my video and to propose a collaboration. And then they gave me a little gift. Concept art. Never before seen concept art for The Future is Wild. These sketches were done by names who I'm sure you're familiar with if you are interested in the field of speculative evolution. People like Dougal Dixon and the late Robert McNeil Alexander. Illustrators in their own right, but certainly more scientifically oriented than most artists that I know. I'm not sure if anyone else would be as excited to see these sketches as I am, but as an artist who grew up with The Future is Wild and who always wondered how these incredible creatures came to be, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We thought it might be fun for me to take these original ideas, explore them a little bit, and then try my hand at creating my own ocean flish. It'll be a fun little exercise for me, uh, taking purely scientific ideas and applying my artistic eye to bring them to life. We're all familiar with the final design that we saw in The Future is Wild, but what if we used the same process taken to create this creature and apply it to a brand new flesh? It's fascinating for me to get an insight into the character design process for a project like The Future is Wild. I'm used to reading about concept art for movies or video games where science takes a back seat to exciting visual design. The real world will always inspire the fictional, but Stan Lee and Steve Ditko were not trying to create a scientifically plausible explanation for why a radioactive bug bite might give you super strength when they created Spider-Man. Similarly, I don't confine my creations to what could or could not be possible in the real world, especially when it comes to projects like the Enigmorphs or my Fakemon regions. For my purposes, the less believable these creatures seem, the better. But as I always say with character design, intent is everything. When it comes to creating a design for a documentary about speculative evolution, it's important that you convey authentic scientific plausibility for that creation. Between the imaginative mind of Dougal Dixon and the scientific mind of Robert McNeil Alexander, a balance was struck to create something both visually exciting and biologically plausible. The Flish as preposterous as it may sound, is not just some impossible science fiction creature. It was designed to educate an audience about evolution, how physical attributes of living animals can change over time to better suit a futuristic environment. Now, because I'm not a scientist, if I were to create a speculative evolution creature for something like The Future is Wild, I would need some groundwork done before I could start illustrating. That's where these sketches come in. Some of the oldest concept art for the Flish might look somewhat different from the kind you're used to seeing. This sketch was done by biomechanical expert Robert McNeil Alexander. Neil was asked to consult on the Futures Wild to help the artists working on the show figure out the logistics of how a fish evolved for powered flight. I like to think of myself as a fairly creative person, but if you handed me this sketch without any context, without any of these notes on it. I, I, I don't think I would have guessed it had anything to do with fish, let, let alone flying fish. This is, of course, a biomechanical sketch, meaning its intention is not to illustrate shape or color or even anatomy, but rather the somewhat abstract principles of structure, function, and motion. As Neil describes it, this diagram is designed to give a rough idea of the shape that the flesh must be to accommodate the necessary muscles. So basically, you could hand this sketch to an artist like me who doesn't have a great grasp on topics like physics and say to them, draw whatever you want, but make sure it adheres to this basic blueprint. Neil explains further in an email that accompanied his initial sketches. The wing area of a typical 0.5 kilogram bird would be a 16th of its mass in kilograms to the power of 0.7 equal to 1 tenth of a meter squared. If the aspect ratio of the flish is 5, a low value, chosen because the longer wings would extend beyond the tail, the span will be 0.7 meters and the mean cord will be 0.14 meters. 
the wing beat frequency is expected to be 3.9 times its mass to the power of negative 0.33 for every 5 cycles per second in steady flight, and perhaps 8 cycles per second at takeoff. With wings of that area, the flish's stalling speed, the minimum possible flying speed, would be about 8 meters per second. Uh, I'm not even sure if I read that right. Fortunately, I don't need to fully understand the mathematics of all of these sketches. All I need to know as an illustrator is that if I want this fish to fly, its body plan must adhere to this basic blueprint. So that's where I started. Literal building blocks that represent muscle groups and other parts of the animal's anatomy. In Neil's sketch, we see each shape labeled as one of these parts. The pectoral muscles, the head, the tail muscles, and so on. This might be as basic as a rough sketch can get, but it is nonetheless crucial to ensure that our flish can at least look capable of powered flight. But we'll get to the flying part in a minute. Surprisingly, or perhaps unsurprisingly, my primary objective was to design the head of my flish. I say unsurprisingly because I'm not a scientist, I'm a character designer, and like a lot of humans, I respond to faces, eyes, mouths, noses, or a lack thereof. Even when we see animals that look nothing like us, we isolate the parts we do recognize and emphasize or subvert them in our own artwork to achieve different reactions from an audience. All this to say that I like designing my creatures from the head down. My first sketches were heavily inspired by the ones done by Neil, but I slowly started to adapt the face with a few things in mind. 1. Birds. The flesh lives in a world without birds, and fills the niche that they left behind. This means that, evolutionarily speaking, they would share a lot of similar physical features with modern birds to help them survive in that same niche. 2. Fish, obviously. Flish evolved from modern-day ray-finned fish, so as much as they may resemble birds physically, their anatomy must be in some way connected to their ancestors. This isn't a sci-fi free-for-all. We're trying to prioritize plausibility over artistic liberty. So I made sure to reference modern-day fish and their adaptations in the design of my flish. And that brings us to our third point, fish jaws. Ocean flish hunt like modern-day seabirds, gliding over the open ocean and swooping down to extract prey from just below the surface. To achieve this, they will have adapted the protruding jaw that many ray-finned fish possess to function like a long beak, reaching out to grab prey and extending the reach of the flish's mouth. I did a little research into fish anatomy to get a better understanding of how these intricate mouths function. There are several minuscule bones, delicate tendons, and strong muscles that allow modern-day fish to extend their mouths up to four times their original length. My flish would employ a similar mechanism that allows it to create a beak it can use to grab prey without itself having to dive below the surface. Mm, the weight. And this mouth plan doesn't look right. These mechanics might work well for a suction feeder, that is, a fish that uses its rapidly extending jaws to suck in prey whole, but our flish is grabbing prey on the wing. It needs a wider gape if it's going to fill the niche of seagulls and terns. I used Neil's rudimentary sketch of the flish jaw mechanics to create something with a little more power to it, simple levers that push the jaw forward and can hold it open, rather than only snap it out for a brief moment. This also gave the flish a bigger mouth overall to help it grab larger prey. Now, as I designed the protruding jaw, I realized that my flish might have a problem. Modern fish that have these extendable jaws spend all their time underwater, so there's no risk of their exposed muscles drying out. They also mostly feed with suction, as I mentioned earlier, pulling prey in with a single gulp, and they don't have a need for biting, holding, or chewing. I needed to come up with a more creative solution for this problem. For this, I actually turned back the clock, moving away from futuristic fish and modern fish, and looking back to their ancient ancestors. The Devonian period is sometimes referred to as the Age of Fish. Back then, jaws were new to the scene, and if you had them at all, they were very primitive. However, I was looking for inspiration from a group of animals that did have something in common with our ocean flish. Pause for a second. Let's go back to the original flish from The Future is Wild. There's something important to keep in mind with these animals. They've replaced birds, yes, we covered that, but if fish are in the sky, what's swimming in the water? 
Silver swimmers, that's what. A diverse family of oversized crustacean larvae, or at least th that's where they evolved from. They kind of look like fish, but unlike the schooling vertebrates that we're used to seeing today, these animals are protected by an armored shell. Okay, back to the Devonian. This ocean is also filled with hard bodies. In fact, even the fish are known for their dermal bone plating. If you want to grab a snack in these seas, you can't just have thin, needle-like teeth. You need hard, crushing jaws that can hold onto and crack open hard-bodied prey. See where I'm going with this? My flesh is going to solve two problems with one evolutionary adaptation. The reintroduction of dermal bone helmets. Over its intricate and flexible jaws is a skull that will protect its inner mouth parts and provide the flesh with a means of crunching down on silver swimmers. I'll be honest with you guys, most of this decision was made because I think Devonian fish look really cool. However, I only came to this conclusion after I realized that there was an evolutionary problem that needed to be solved. So, like, 60% artistic liberty, 40% scientific accuracy. Now we can move on to the fins. Neil's explanation of the flish proposes that the pectoral fin would be adapted for flight, with strengthened rays at the frontmost edge of either fin to support the rest of the wing. Originally, these rays were described as being not only the structure of the wing, but also the mechanism. However, after some revisions, this idea shifted and became more like the wings we see in other animals that have evolved for powered flight. Bones and muscles with a membrane stretching out from them that actually flap like the wings of a bird. Fish, after all, evolved from the same ancestors as all vertebrates, and though they look very different, fish, humans, and birds all have the same basic bones and muscles comprising their limbs. Given time, these bones would evolve to resemble those of other animals capable of powered flight. My flish wings used this basic plan, moving up on the body and protruding just above the armored and insulating brachiostigial rays. From there, I went down to the pelvic fins. Now, this might come as a surprise to some of you, but even in the modern day, there are fish that have pelvic fins adapted for terrestrial locomotion. Mudskippers use them to support themselves on land. The pelvic fins of the tripod fish prop it up without it needing to swim, and frogfish literally walk on the sea floor. In Neil's initial sketches, he proposes that the flish takes this adaptation a bit further, evolving strong, flexible rays strengthened by muscles that allow it to support itself on solid land. In The Future is Wild, we don't get to see the ocean flish maneuver on land. However, in this concept art for the creatures, we can see that there was thought put into how they would land, walk, and take off. In an email describing his concept art, McNeil Alexander wrote, a major problem in designing an animal that can run, swim, and fly is to provide enough muscle for all three modes of locomotion. Ducks achieve it by using the same muscles for swimming as for walking, and I propose similarly in Flish to use the same muscles for locomotion on land as in water. On land, Flish hop rather like frogs. The 0.15 kilograms of tail muscle and pelvic fin muscle together, doing work amounting to 30 joules per kilogram in a maximum effort, could give the animal 4.5 joules of kinetic energy at takeoff for a jump, throwing it into the air at a speed of about 4.2 meters per second, enough for a high jump of 0.9 meters or a long jump of 1.8 meters. I'll unpack all of that for those of you who, like me, started to zone out the second that numbers were brought up. Basically, the flish can twist its tail to create something like a third leg no giggling now, that would propel it from behind, while its pelvic fins supported it in the front. As Neil said, it could hop around on land like a frog, perhaps somewhat awkward, but not any more so than most seabirds that we have today. They're better at flying than walking. Now that the body plan was more or less figured out, it was time for the fun part, colors. I always enjoy creating color palettes for a creature, whether it's grounded in reality or entirely fictional. In fact, I think I like using inspiration from nature more than just making stuff up. Nature is really good at arranging colors in visually pleasing ways. Birds and fish in particular boast some of the most stunning visual designs in the animal kingdom, and exploring those designs for use in my work is a really cool exercise. A few factors inform color in animals, their environment, their behaviors, and the physical makeup of their bodies. For example, a tiger's striking orange and black stripes have evolved to camouflage it in the dense jungle from prey. 
You might wonder why it's orange then and not green, as to us, orange stands out very clearly in a leafy brush. Well, the first reason for that is that the melanin that colors the tiger's hair can't create a natural green color. However, it doesn't actually need to. Deer, a tiger's main prey, can't see orange, and that's why human hunters will wear bright orange vests when they're out in the field. Humans can see it just fine, so they won't shoot each other, but the eyes of a deer won't register it as a bright, high contrast color. To them, it blends in with the environment. So we see how environment, behavior, and physical makeup informs animal colors. Our flish's environment is coastal. It lives by the shore and hunts at sea. They're aerial hunters, swooping down from above to snatch prey out of the water. And they're fairly social, with dozens of flish hunting in the same waters and presumably nesting together as well. They even communicate with one another by singing. And though they look like birds, they're still covered in scales. Therefore, the range of colors they are able to achieve will be limited by the physical properties of scales. I looked at modern day animals that share these common traits with the ocean flesh. Tuna, terns, gulls, auks, mahi-mahi, and somewhat obviously, flying fish. I have a few color schemes that I'm happy with, but the first one I created is probably still my favorite. Strong counter shading, that is, its colors are lighter on the bottom than they are on the top, a common adaptation for aerial and aquatic hunters, a bright red jaw that can be used by other flish in various socializations, and subtle yellow accents like those seen in sports fish. Some other palette options include the bluebird, the dolphin fish, and the puffin, or so I've decided to call them. You guys can let me know in the comments which one of these you like best. With our colors complete, I'd say that we have a finished flish. Somewhat different from the design used in the Futures Wild, but definitely similar to Dougal Dixon's completed design. I mean, we were working off the same source material, so I guess that makes sense. Now, if I were to hand this over to Robert McNeil Alexander, I'm sure he'd give me some very constructive criticism. It was actually really funny reading through the feedback he gave to Dixon on his sketches. That middle ground between scientific and imaginative is hard to reach, and that's why it's always important to have a diverse team with different backgrounds working on a project like this. I don't have a biomechanics expert to hand my sketches off to, so that's where you come in. If you're a biologist, or a paleontologist, or an ichthyologist, or if you just know more about evolution than I do, give me your thoughts on my flish down in the comments. Which flish do you think is more plausible? Which one do you like better? Do you like one better than the other because it seems more plausible, or maybe just because it looks cooler? The final design used in The Future is Wild definitely has charisma. It's brightly colored, alien looking, but familiar enough that it tells the whole story of the docuseries with one design. What if fish replaced birds? It's not as preposterous as you might think. Thank you guys for watching this video. If you're watching this on The Future is Wild's official YouTube channel, be sure to come check out my channel subjectively for more creature designs. But be warned, science takes a back seat in a lot of my illustrations. If you liked my illustrations and you want to make some flish designs of your own, check out our Gumroad page to purchase the digital brushes that I used in this video. The link is down in the description. We have a bunch of different brush packs that'll help you make artwork like mine, and any purchase helps to support me and my channel. We have some plans to make more videos like this one, diving into concept art for other The Future is Wild designs and reimagining them with new artwork. So if you liked this video, be sure to let me know down in the comments and leave us a thumbs up. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.